And I will turn it over to Chris Wisman, who is with New England Aquaventus, and he's going to talk to us about his offshore wind project. Thank you for joining us. All right. Well, terrific, Sarah. So thank you for this opportunity. Really appreciate it. And um, I just want to let you all know I'm a lifetime member, and I can actually remember back in 1990 when I first put my first Sierra Club sticker on the back of my car. I was very proud to do so. So really glad to be here. Yeah, so I'm going to share with you all um, a handful of PowerPoint slides. I don't want to do death by PowerPoint. And so, Sarah, I would encourage you to if people lob questions as we're going. Glad to entertain things because a lot of times people have questions on, on individual slides. So I'm really glad to, to take any interruption that you guys see fit. So um, I just, I want to start with kind of um, giving everybody perspective on what offshore wind has become. Um, it has become actually a really, really big business. Um, it's been big business in Europe for now really about 10 years. And this table here on the left is a, is a tabulation of the, the goals of just really six or seven states down the eastern seaboard. And if you look at the bottom of that column in the middle, it's capacity commitment in terms of megawatts. That is a lot of power. So 31,000 megawatts is basically the peak load of all of New York State. It's kind of close to the peak load of all of New England. It is a lot. And it has become really the go-to solution for states that are seeking large blocks of renewable energy kind of close to big cities, Boston, New York, right? And this already represents almost $100 billion in capital cost. It is at the early stage of creating thousands of jobs. Um, for some of us, there was really big news yesterday in that the Vineyard Wind Project, that's sort of the first project, the first big project off of Massachusetts, actually got approval by the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management yesterday. That was after pretty much being stalled for the last four years. So. Um, what Maine has done really recently is harness two of the biggest players. That is us, that's part of, we are part of the Mitsubishi Corporation and RWE, which is a big German utility that actually has been involved in offshore wind for about 20 years. So lots of experience in Europe. And, and the thing that, that I like to hammer home to everybody and it doesn't matter which sort of political end of the spectrum you are, is that first line up here, is that solving climate change has become really an economic opportunity. It's, it's not just an imperative, it's actually an opportunity to put people to work. And it's not put people to work just for, you know, a couple of weeks or years. I, I think this is a generation long switch, my perspective. Um, who we are, I know this is a little bit out of order, but I wanted to get that under our belts first is, is really how big this is. So if you look at the boxes here, this one down here, I am part of Diamond Offshore Wind. Diamond Offshore Wind, when you chase up ownership, is actually owned by the Mitsubishi Corporation out of, uh, out of Tokyo. RWE, I mentioned, is big utility out of Germany. Together, we have formed what is known as New England Aquaventus, and we have partnered with the University of Maine to build on their pretty much decades worth of good work in um, developing offshore wind in Maine and developing a particular floating foundation that I'll show you that really fits the bill for Maine. Um, I, I do wanna just, before we dive into the, into the specifics of the foundation, I just wanted to show you, again, it's a little bit more context so that everybody understands this. Um, offshore wind is coming to Maine. There has been a lot of activity south of here. And if you can see these, I, I know it ends up being pretty small on your screen, but you see these multicolored, this sort of rainbow color. Those are the leases off of Massachusetts and Rhode Island that started getting leased back in 2013. And they are sort of known as Massachusetts leases, right? That would enable Massachusetts to achieve its goals. The challenge for um, Massachusetts is that New York has come on really strong 
seeking in the near term 9,000 megawatts of offshore wind, and it had one stinking lease, this little blue area right off of New York City. And so what's happened over the last um, couple of years is New York has awarded multiple projects that actually are going to use that Massachusetts real estate, meaning there's much less for Mass Massachusetts to achieve its goals. So that big black hour, arrow over there is to really indicate that um, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, even Connecticut and such need more real estate, if you will. And they are coming around the corner and looking very, very closely at the Gulf of Maine. You've probably heard about this interstate, interstate task force, um, which is Maine, New Hampshire, um, and Massachusetts really looking at how to utilize it. So the real question up here in the left is to what extent Maine will harness this industry to create new economic development. And so you may have heard in the news, right, the, the concept of a research array. And the idea of a research array, in addition to the Monhegan project, I'll differentiate the two in a minute, is really to help steer the eventual leasing of the Gulf of Maine in such a way that it doesn't imperil fisheries. Now, we know fishermen don't want any project anywhere in the Gulf of Maine. I just don't believe that that's reality. They're coming. And so the idea of the state is to be in a best position to influence the direction that these go. And, and by influence, that could be turbines are spaced very wide apart. It could be that, that the mooring lines fit a certain configuration. It could be that there's just a big transit zone. I'll just give you a, a lesson that wasn't, that we should learn from that wasn't learned. If you look at, again, these multicolored leases off of Massachusetts, they are kind of right smack between major fishing fleets. So good old New Bedford, you know, Moby Dick and their fishing grounds off the Georges Bank. And so the fishermen cried out and said, hey, wait a minute, you just erected this big obstacle and we need to go 50 miles out of our way to get around it. A little bit more consultation with fishermen could have avoided something that, that in hindsight looks as simple as that. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and that's what the state is trying to avoid in having numerous workshops with fishermen to try and figure out how is it that offshore wind and fisheries can best coexist. The second really big bullet down here is by do, using a, a sort of small research array to develop and prove out Maine's ports and contractors and supply chains, it established them as leaders. Some of um, us in the business kind of look back maybe 15 years ago um, to Iowa. Little Iowa was one of the absolute leaders in, in seeking renewable energy from wind and because it was a leader, it actually now has the factories. It has a supply chain and it literally has thousands upon thousands of people working in, in, uh, in wind. And so to a certain extent, that's the model that, that Maine is seeking. The first step is the single turbine Monhegan project. Now the turbine over there on the right, I know it, show, it still shows two, our art is a little bit out of date, but um, the single turbine project is ultimately to prove that the University of Maine technology really can be built in Maine. And that may sound um, like, well, like, how do you prove it? It's not that complicated. I'll show you some pictures in a minute that show you just how gigantic this device is that makes it clear that you really need to figure out an entire supply chain strategy, how you launch these things, how you build them on land. Over here on the right are some numbers. Each foundation weighs about 10,000 tons. That diameter of just the yellow portion on the bottom is basically almost a football field. So this is really big. Um, the Monhegan project is um, just gonna give you a couple of near, of near term and actually recent activities now. We had a Booth Bay public, public meeting uh, last week, it was largely taken over by an open mic night um, where the fishermen could air their grievances, but we spent a lot of time with selectmen and uh, 
and and folks sort of explaining how this could work for Booth Bay in that there are two organizations right in Booth Bay that could really benefit from, from offshore wind. One is research, one is a local uh, basically boat builder. And so this is exactly what we're trying to foster in Maine is making it an industry that utilizes really Maine talent to, to further the industry. So one of the cool things that you'll see in the next, uh, it's actually, it got pushed off slightly. It's going to be next weekend. Starts is, is a cable route survey. We uh, have to survey the entire cable. If you imagine this single turbine has a cable that's going to run all the way into Booth Bay to connect to the grid. And we want to bury that cable just as, as much as we can to make sure that it doesn't upset fishermen. Um, I'll show you a, bit, a little bit more on that in a minute. We are finalizing a turbine. Um, we are working with the worldwide heavyweights. That's Vesta, Siemens, and GE. Those are the three manufacturers that are really in offshore wind. We're doing lots of engineering and we are working with contractors on how to build this. And this is a smattering of Maine based contractors like Reed and Reed and, Ch and Chimbro and worldwide um, heavyweights. Um, they're not the household names necessarily, but the likes of Mammut that know how to move big things around. Um, we are starting the full NEPA review, even with the misspelling of the word full here. Full NEPA review um, will be conducted by the DOE. And we're building, it's kind of interesting because we're stepping in after the University of Maine has done all of the long-term studies. Great bird studies, some of those uh, conducted by the Audubon, and then visual impact studies, all the sort of archaeological studies, all sorts of different stuff. So we're able to sort of dive right into the NEPA review and our rough timeline going forward is to finalize this cable landing really somewhere here by the really next couple of weeks. We start the public permitting information sessions in the first half of the year. And that's, it was a little bit, we wanted to start a lot earlier. We were hoping that those public sessions could actually be in person. I think we've all now finally given in to Zoom. Hopefully we can do things in person by the summer but this is the, seems to be the, the only forum to do this. We hope to have all permits in hand and ready to go sometime in 2022. Start fabrication on land of this foundation in 2022. The turbine would arrive then in spring of 23. And that's when it gets to be really interesting. We erect the turbine on this foundation spring, summer, 2023, and then tow it out to sea in 2023. And my analogy is this going out the Penobscot River, the whole Penobscot Bay, it's gonna be like the 4th of July parade. I'm familiar with the Thomaston parade. So it, that's my metaphor is, I think there will be boats lined up. I think a lot of people will come out to see this. So it should be a real, a real um, big spectacle. And uh, this is the yeah, Sorry, sure. only because you said you're we are okay to be interrupted. We did have a, a, a couple questions. Um, uh, yeah. Although it looks like one may have been answered by another participant. So one, what does NEPA mean? Um, oh. But someone said National Environmental Policy Act. And then somebody else asked, by full NEPA review, do you mean an EIS or EA? What do you mean by a review? Yeah, so, so it is, yes. And, E, what's called an EA FONSI, right? So an environmental assessment and a finding of no significant impact is what is sought. And, and uh, lay, lay person speak, that means that it's demonstrated not to have a significant impact on any species. Birds, particular focus on endangered species. Right, that you can build this thing and we don't expect anything adverse to happen. So that's that's the goal. Perfect, thank you. Sure. So this cable route survey that I spoke about, um, so this helps show you the site, right? So Monhegan is over here in the lower right-hand corner. The turbine is almost due south of Monhegan, um, two and a half miles offshore. And the cable route follows this sort of zigzag and, and that's partly because this dotted line is the demarcation between water that is controlled by the state of Maine and water that is controlled by the federal government. 
And if we were to go straight across this federal government water, we have about a separate three-year engagement with the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management to get the rights to do that. So we are going, following the state waters route, go up, turn left, head over, and basically up to East Booth Bay. We're starting this cable route in March, and it is admittedly tough weather in March, but we're doing it because there are many fewer lobster traps out this time of year than there would be in any nicer weather. So um, so really that's why we're doing it, capitulation number one. And then we've been consulting with fishermen. We had a, a number of different um, discussions, big and small. So we worked with Maine Coastal Fishermen's Association to convene local fishermen that are impacted. So those are the guys from sort of friendship in Bristol that fish out here. Now, by and large, I will say none of them want offshore wind, but some of them will say, well, if you're gonna do it, you know, move that cable over here, avoid this, do that. And we got into a, a really good engagement and then offline with a couple of fishermen that had uh, just great feedback. So um, you will see almost universally negative um, comments from fishermen when they operate as a group and when they are quoted in the press, but individuals are actually quite a bit more helpful. So as a result of this cable route survey, we want to find a place we can bury it and we want to make sure that we can land where we think we, where we, where we want to. Just want to give you a little bit of, of history too on other cables run in Maine. So this is sort of zooming in. If you can see on the left of this picture, it's Rockland Harbor. And you have Vinyl Haven or sort of the group of islands, Vinyl Haven, Fox Island, off to the right here. And in about 1977, there was a line run, this blue dotted line. There was a cable run to power the island in the first place. And when they ran the cable in those days, they just literally laid it on the sea bottom. And, um, and it ran like that for a number of years until the current year after year started dragging it on some rocks. It started faulting, like having problems a lot. It needed to get fixed a lot. And this cable was replaced in 2005. And by then there were much more robust sort of standards in place for how to bury cables and have them last for decades without a problem. So they found this route that is now marked in red that where the cable could be buried the entire length. It was buried in 2005 using modern techniques, which is a jet plow. The jet plow is a device that um, basically is a stream of nozzles that push high speed water, basically high speed, and it momentarily sort of creates a trench in the seabed. The cable is laid in that, and the, the vast majority of the sediment then just drops right back into that, that trench. And, and that's kind of considered state of the art. You can put these down all, you know, six feet in general is the goal. And if you look at what even the most intrusive fishermen do, it is scalloping or scalloping in main waters. I'm a little further south, I call it scalloping. Scalloping um, is essentially a rake that goes across the seabed and occasionally when it's not tuned properly can penetrate you know, a foot or a foot and a half down. So this is way beyond that and allows basically anything to happen over the top. Over the, the, top. the point really is um, that neither of these were an obstacle for fishermen, um, but both the old and the new, if you can see these dotted outlines around each of these, they show up on the NOAA charts as cable areas. And a cable area in state law ends up restricting fishermen. You're not allowed to fish over a cable area. Now, I, I'll tell you anecdotally, it's not enforced at all. Technically speaking, it's to be restricted. Our goal in Monhegan is to follow this sort of same idea. Is we're going to bury it in a similar fashion. It's now state of the art, but the difference is and this goes back even certainly 1977, even 2005 is using modern uh, GIS technology, right? It's the same stuff in your cell phone that allows you to precisely locate within one meter where the cable actually is located. If that's the case, then 
the, the folks, so NOAA, that administers the charts, they are the ones that literally publish the charts, don't need to have it show up as a cable area and it doesn't trigger main law that restricts fishing. Fishing. So that's our goal is to use the little single turbine Monohegan project as a way of establishing best practices for, for offshore wind going forward. And, and it's an issue because fishermen, if you look at all of this area made up by these cable, air, cable areas, it's more area than the wind farm itself. So they wanted to make sure that there were no, no obstacles. And so that's one of the, I think, good elements of feedback that we've had by, um, by working with fishermen. We now know what they, what they needed. So why the research array? I, I'm proactively offering the why because people do end up asking that. Okay, we're doing this Monhegan project, we're doing a research array. The Monhegan project is to verify, as I mentioned earlier, that the University of Maine design works for Maine, that it's economically viable and can be built in Maine and create local jobs, right? So in, it's in the category of proving that concrete floats. The purpose of the research array is actually a lot bigger than that. It's to evaluate how offshore wind projects can work with traditional ocean users at a scale that's reflective of future commercial scale projects. No, that's a mouthful. Traditional ocean users we look at as clearly human fishermen, but it's also other occupants, right? Right whales are really key. There is virtually no information worldwide um, to indicate how marine mammals work with floating offshore wind because it's in a deeper, deeper environment. The, um, the bullet number two there is to conduct specifically research that will allow commercial scale, scale projects to be implemented responsibly. That will be um, all sorts of different technology uh, solutions. Do we have mooring lines that go straight down, go way out? What are they made out of? How do we do the anchoring? All sorts of different things like that. And then allowing fisheries and, and offshore wind to coexist. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we do want to influence BOEM leasing, BOEM leasing and approval process. A, a legitimate outcome of doing the research array is don't put them within 30 miles of shore because we fish there. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not kidding. It could be you want these bid projects to be really far offshore. And then the fourth bullet is absolutely to establish Maine as the hub for floating offshore wind jobs in the East Coast. And that's that's key because um, there's a big difference between floating offshore wind infrastructure and fixed bottom foundations. I should have shown a picture. Fixed bottom is um, two predominant technologies. One is what's called a monopile. It is literally a giant steel um, cylinder, giant, like you could fit your house in it. Two inch thick steel, it is pounded in, into the seabed. Um, and that doesn't work in very deep water. So that technology is off the list. Jacket foundations, which are um, more like a bar stool, a four-legged stool. Similarly, they go in a little bit deeper water, but they don't go into really deep water. And so um, those are both going to be used extensively really south of Cape Cod. So projects off of New York and New Jersey are almost all jackets and monopiles. The opportunity is for Maine to really corner the floating offshore wind job market, establish the ports, show that everybody can do it, and then be in a position to essentially potentially serve other states with floating offshore wind in that there are not many harbors that are of the scale that are necessary to accommodate this industry. Um, I want to show you scale, right? Because um, people also are concerned about the scale of this this uh, research array. But what this is on the right here are these are the leases off of Massachusetts. And generally, these are 150,000 acres or more, some of them 165,000 acres. What the state is looking for is this little red box in here. That's about the scale, is a 10,000 acre, um, 16 square mile research lease. So it's only about 7% of size. So that's the major difference between research lease and a, and a commercial scale lease, much, much smaller. 
And Chris, um, yeah. So just going back to your last slide, we did have one question. And I don't know, Sue, if, if this has been answered. Um, but has the floating technology been proven at this point, or is it still being worked on? It is still being worked on. That really is the function of the Monhegan project. So I will elaborate extensively, right? So there are lots of really big floating oil rigs around the world, right? Um, little point of fact, there's almost 6,000 structures in the Gulf of Mexico. Now, the vast majority of those are, are, as I said, monopiles and jackets, but there's also big floating structures. So the, the real difference is that those floating structures in the oil and gas industry are all like, you know, I'm going to call it like billion dollar structures. Each one is just gigantic. And so the challenge has been scaling down the technology to accommodate wind turbines and then making it cost effective. So the issue is not whether we can build something. It's that note there on the second line there is whether or not it can be built economically. So really that's what the Monhegan project is about, is about figuring out a way that we can build that foundation economically and then use those lessons learned eventually into in something like the research array. Now, there are a whole bunch, not, not that many, but three current projects in Europe that are sort of onesie twosies of uh, different types of technologies. Those are right now all steel foundations. And so the opportunity is for Maine is to build with concrete as opposed to steel in that we don't have steel in the state of the magnitude to build these things. There are actually very few, there's not even, a, not even a, a port on the East Coast that can build steel of the size that's necessary. So the whole trick with the um, University of Maine Foundation is that they've come up with this concrete foundation that is, it kind of uses um, a technology that bridge builders are used to. So you all probably drove past the bridge um, between New Hampshire and Maine. I think it's Route 1, right off 95 to your left as you're going south. And um, it's that exact same technology. You build pieces, you lift them in place with a crane, piece by piece by piece, and essentially you have a big structure at the end. That's what, that's what we're doing. And I'm going to show you a little bit of that. So any questions? Actually, just a, one note on this, this slide. Um, so as you know, a few wealthy fee people live on Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket. Um, and many of them didn't want to see wind turbines. By and large, um, what Massachusetts and to a lesser extent New York uh, determined is that somewhere between 12 and 15 miles, you would not have a significant view shed disruption. So that was part of this original um, sort of line here. You can't really see it exactly. A lot of these bites out of it are because there are shipwrecks and rocks and things like that. But it was originally a sort of circle and a line and a zigzag to avoid interrupting the view shed. The state of Maine has actually been more conservative than that. They've said, we're not going to build this within 20 miles of land. So this is a little picture of what the research array would look like. And it gives you somewhat of a, a better, I, this is probably hard to see on your screens, right? You can see these closed turbines. But this is what they're like about a mile apart, right? This is a little pod of four. Then one option is to have two miles between them and the next pod. And that would be to sort of test out the idea of having a corridor for bigger ships to go between these things. The little white line is the sort of theoretical area that fishermen really shouldn't go. And, and shouldn't go would mean sort of prudently, you run a greater risk of, and a lobsterman specifically, of getting your traps tangled on mooring lines and things like that. And so what you can see is the vast majority of the wind farm is actually open for business as usual. Not necessarily for scallopers, but definitely for, for lobstermen. Um, I want to, I'm going to, I, my next slide is actually to pause on questions. I know I've been using up a quite a bit of time here, but I do want to flip to one other slide that is just cool. It'll give you the scale of what we're talking about here. 
This is a current, just the, the top piece of a current state-of-the-art offshore wind turbine. These are really big, right? So this is, um, and I apologize, I don't remember the weight, but it's kind of in the neighborhood of four or 500 tons. This has to be lifted up on top of that giant tower. And so here you can see what it's just like relative to mere human beings. So everything literally has to be moved by sea. Everything in this um, business is very nautical. It can't be shipped on roads or on even railroad. So I will pause there for questions. I am glad to, um, I am glad to flip around to different slides. I can answer any questions you like, but I didn't want to just talk at you for hours. So over to you, sorry. Yes, yeah, so I would invite folks, you can raise your hand virtually or take yourself off mute or add any questions to the chat um, if you prefer to have me read them. Um, but yeah, we'd love to hear what questions folks have. And absent that, I can show I can show you a few more slides that will give you a bit more of um, a grounding in the in the construction. And while we wait, one question, there are a couple of questions that I get repeatedly, but um, one is thinking about this project in particular, what does it mean for energy generation for the state of Maine? So I will speak pretty candidly in that one turbine for the state of Maine isn't much. We're a rounding error in the vagaries of um, the state. I have uh, Dave Wilby on the line, who I think has the number of households that we would power, probably closer to his fingertips than, than me. Dave, if you're listening, not to put you on the spot to take you off mute, but if you can. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a little bit over 5,000 households, the equivalent of 5,000 something uh, main households. Uh, this is uh, the, the cable uh, from the demonstration turbine would be interconnected to the grid um, in Lincoln County. And so for sake of context, it's about a third of the total number of households in Lincoln County uh, at um, over the course of a year, its annual output. So you can see, I mean, as these turbines get really, really big, you don't really need that many of them. Now, the state already gets a lot of its power from land-based wind, and we'll be getting more from solar. So there, in my opinion, there will never be, you know, a thousand offshore wind turbines because they're so big now. So it really isn't a specter of them being everywhere. It's, we're talking about a handful of, of wind farms. And we have some questions that have been added to the chat. Um, going back to the floating technology, how much work will it take to perfect it? Um, and when is it expected to be done by? Yeah, good, good question. So we're, we're working through the design for the one turbine project now, right? And so that design process is going to take us about another year. And we're working very closely in what we, with what we call constructability. So um, we don't want to create a design that literally says you have to pour the entire thing in one giant batch form because that would be impossible to build. So we're working really in hand and glove. And I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you a, actually a picture to help uh, see if I can put this back on, on bear with me. Um, and now, sorry, just the, I have to go to Zoom classes tonight to, to perfect this screen sharing. Getting there, almost. Okay, so what you see in this slide is we are in, if this is the foundation, it's gonna be built on land, 300 feet across, 10,000 tons. There is nothing that can pick that up, right? In Maine, much less most of the rest of the world. 
So we are building it in bite-sized pieces. You have what we call the keystone here. That will probably be one form in place. You have each of these arms. This is kind of like a view into the arm. And then you have these columns. And to give you a, a, a really zero in on how big this is and what we're trying to do to get to that perfected design is this is one of the arms. And this is, this is a view looking into the end of that arm, a person for scale. And what we're doing is, come, is refining the design to basically build this in truck size pieces so that the fabrication can be kind of spread around the state and you can truck the pieces in and put them all together at Mac point. So it is this element of design that is um, being perfected for just building it once, but building it once will be like the hand-built um, Rolls-Royce. Then as we get to the research array, we will probably have learned from this how to put these pieces together maybe more efficiently, how to turn it a bit more into a factory process, and we'll continue to refine that, refine that design. So it's a, it's a continual process of improvement to the point where by the time the research array is built, we think we will have a really good method for setting up a factory and then being able to do, you know, kind of 50 of these at a time. So it's a multiple year process. There's no absolute answer to it. It's when is it good enough to go into production is really is the bottom line. Awesome. Does that help? Um, yeah, so going to the next question, is there any notion that the lease areas can function as fishery sanctuaries? Yes, I'm really pleased that you asked that. I, so I've been observing this um, fishery sanctuary or sort of sanctuaries in the ocean around the world where there's a movement to do kind of like 100 square mile blocks and just let the entire ecosystem reestablish itself. So um, at a very minimum, that slide that I showed a minute ago there oh, has these little, little pods that are sanctuaries where um, there's a lot to say here. Has any, have anybody, there's a question to the audience. Has anybody seen pictures of the ocean bottom before and after a uh, dragging has been done to um, either catch scallops or something else? They're quite striking because you see the ocean bottom and lots of little things growing before, and then this device scrapes the ocean bottom and is literally turned into a desert that then takes years to reestablish itself. These areas would allow, as, as far as I'm concerned, scallops to grow to be like really big, like scallops you haven't seen in, you know, 50 years. And, and that leads to the same concept of breeders, right? Breeding lobsters, this sort of secret of lobsters um, creating uh, more lobsters is to let them get big enough. Same idea here. You create little sanctuaries, and at a minimum, these little these little white areas will be sanctuaries. We're not sure, frankly, to what extent for scalloping, those sanctuaries would be bigger because you do have um, mooring lines. One design is that mooring lines kind of go out a little ways, and if those mooring lines do go out, then this sanctuary effect would actually be quite a bit bigger. It could be. Um, a circle that is maybe four times the size of the circle that's shown here. So yeah, it's a, it's a thing. That could be part of the research too. Is I mean, what we're what we had thought, we are not ocean scientists, but what we thought is that would be really a really good long-term study is to see what impact this has. That's really interesting. I'd love to see what what that result would be. Right. Um, David, I think we answered your question about the output of the Monhegan array, but if there's more information you're looking for on that, just feel free to add it to the chat or to, to chime in. Um, we have another question that asks, 
asks, how does the energy get distributed once it's on land? The very simple answer is it just goes wherever the wires take it. <laughs> the grid um, is the great equalizer. Basically, power flows to, to whoever's using it. So it's, yeah, it's not like you can tag the electrons. It really just enters the grid and then flows wherever it flows. All right, and uh, this is a good question. So former Governor LePage pulled the plug on the Norwegian offshore wind project in Maine some years ago. Do you see any political risks for completing this project this time? So the very short answer is no. I think, uh, you know, Gover Governor Mills, if you look at her statements and her actions, is really tremendously supportive of offshore wind and in the much bigger context of we have to do whatever it takes to battle climate change and offshore wind is just one of the things that that we need to do and so it's a pretty um i have to say it's not big bang in that she's not saying build a gigantic project it's very deliberate and i think it is a it strikes the right balance between recognizing that we need this resource but we also need to preserve the heritage industries of maine right you don't want to mess up view shed you don't want to mess up fishing you want to make sure it's done right so i think she's really supportive Did I lose you all? Or just Sarah? Oh, I think you lost me for a second. Yep, I think we lost Sorry. you. I can never tell it was me or you. Okay. <laughs> all right, Sarah. <laughs> I, I will take a look at the um, chat in Sarah's absence. And if anybody else. Except Sarah, you control the mute button. If you can unmute folks, maybe that would work too. Well, I will, I'll take a moment in Sarah's absence to also um, introduce uh, Dave Wilby. I guess I'm putting you on the spot again. There is an emerging sort of support group called the uh, Gulf of Maine Sustainability Alliance that I would encourage folks here to log on to and, and sign up for um, communications pretty much on offshore wind. Dave, what is the, um, what is the uh, web address of that? Gulf of Maine Sustainability Alliance.com. Or yes. you can go to just the GOMSA, T-H-E-G-O-M-S-A. And, and I think that, as I understand it, that is formed to acknowledge that sustainability, offshore wind is just part of it. So it's sustainability of everything in, in the Gulf of Maine, right? If you look at where we were, what, 150 years ago, it was clipper ships were our industry, right? And now it's really just fishing, but could also be offshore wind. And so the idea is just sustainability really across the board. Sarah, are you back? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. <laughs> One of the negative side effects of working from home. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not the most reliable internet. Um, so I, because I left and came back on, I lost all the comments in the chat, but I don't know, Anya, if you happen to be keeping track of them. And if you want to just keep going, that's totally fine with me. I don't know where we left off. <laughs> I, I had a question about um, which agency, this is Kim, um, which agency is determining um, whether you have to do an EA or an EIS, in other words, making that FONSI determination, which is that Department of Energy, is it NOAA, who, who is making that determination? Department of Energy. Yeah. I've got a whole NEPA team, attorneys and, you know, experts and so forth.
Great. Were there any other uh, questions that folks had? And uh, it looks like there's a question about what is an EA and EIS. Can you explain what that is for folks? So I'm not a, I'm not a permitting expert. So I, um, I don't know that I can character. I mean, the actual terms are environmental assessment versus environmental impact statement. They are very similar in that they cover the same issues. Um, I think an EA is done more when uh, it's considered a smaller project to have a smaller imprint on anything. View, whales, birds. And it's uh, to a certain extent a discretion of the, of the agency that's taking it on. But I don't really know that I have to say, I'm not a programming expert, I don't know the discretion. Right. Uh, there's another um, question that is assuming the Mahigan array is a success. What do you see looking ahead? Yeah, so um, looking ahead is really a couple things. Um, to a great extent, what is going to happen regardless of us is the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management is eventually going to um, catch up its leasing program. So it's going to prioritize leases off of New York in the next year or two, um, California, one of the Carolinas, um, because they use things that were sort of in the process uh, and then stalled during the Trump administration. And this task force that is the tri-state task force will essentially convene and there will be leases that carve up the Gulf of Maine. So that's, that's what's happening regardless of us. What we would do with success of the Monhegan project is continue to support the state in its quest to build a research array quickly enough that it can steer that ship can steer the BOEM ship and influence the way leases are both um, defined first and then how they how the later project specifics are defined. So it could be don't put your turbines closer than a mile from each other. It could be you can only bury your cable. You have to make sure you provide that the cable is doesn't create a charted cable area. Um, we could go through a litany of different things. There's an entire sort of research plan that the state is working on with others. I have to admit, I've not been on those uh, Zoom, all of those Zoom calls. And the idea is to hear from all of the experts and the fishermen what's going on out there and what they need answers to in order to prudently do it. So our goal as a developer, we would like to be, we'd like to build the research array. My metaphor is that we would be building the laboratory and then all of the others from University of Maine to Bigelow Labs to Woods Hole would conduct research in and around the, the wind turbines to answer, to answer those questions. So that's what we see over the next couple of years. I think there's um, uh, a lot of public outreach, a lot of permitting, a whole lot of discussion that will still continue at the state level between folks like yourselves, fishermen, um, I would say specifically other, um, I'm not gonna say not species, but you know, if you look at folks like the Audubon that are advocating obviously for birds, but also right whales, because there's a lot of really specific um, sort of areas of knowledge that really need to be developed over the next couple of years. All right, a couple of questions just keep rolling in. Uh, who is on the Tri-State Task Force making decisions how to carve up the Gulf of Maine? I actually, I will have to say, I don't know other than generally it is represent, representatives of, um, of government of each of those three states. I don't know how one gets on the task force. I believe that if you go to the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management website, so I think you can just Google that, and you look up Maine or New Hampshire, it'll lead to 
the historical task force work, which is now getting old. It's more than a year old. The first, first time they convened was before COVID and they haven't convened since. Um, and probably find out how you get on it, who was on it, who attended, and who, who will be on it in the future. And we have one more question, and perhaps this is a good one to end on, unless there's any other questions that come in, but um, how do we reach you with any further questions? Ah, good question. Here. This is this is the easiest, because this then gets to a clearinghouse, the info at, at dowdev.com leads into us and then, so we have a couple of representatives on the phone that I haven't, I haven't necessarily introduced, but um, that allows us to then figure out what, you know, who's best to answer the question. And then you can call us and you can actually go to our website. That website will be continuously emerging. Um, and so we'll start putting more and more information on that. And if you wanna get in touch with me directly, you have to reach out to Sarah and get my contact information. <laughs> I do have the contact information. If Chris is willing for, to allow me to share that, I would be happy to do that as well. Yeah, I, I'd be glad to. Okay, and um, and thank you, Dave, for for sharing an email in there in the chat as well. Um, well, if that if those were all the questions, thank you so much for this presentation. We have uh, some other thank yous in the in the chat. This is was extremely informative. Uh, we've been looking forward to this one for a while. So I really appreciate you taking the time and going through this with, uh, with us. Um, the presentation for that last question has been recorded. We will send it out to everybody who registered and we will also post it on our YouTube page. If there are folks that you want to see this who weren't able to join us today, um, we wanna share as much, share this with um, as many people who are interested in viewing it uh, just to, share information on this project. So thank you again for joining us and uh, we appreciate it. Well, thank you so much, Sarah, for the opportunity. Great, great to uh, spend the time with you all. Thank you, good, good to join. Take care. Well, thank you everyone, have a great day. Bye, Bye. thanks. Bye.